Okay, so how are you? Good. Thank you very much for coming to listen to me tonight. The light is very strong in my face. <laughs> so I can't see you, so I pretend I'm seeing people <laughs> standing in front of me. Okay, I, um, I'm very grateful that I got this opportunity to talk uh, about this subject. I'm talking about a mystery that puzzled me all my life, and I found a way to let it unfold and found answers to it after many years of struggle. Uh, the mystery I'm going to talk about is this, something very simple. How we intend to do things, and then what we actually do. You see what I mean? Like, uh, have you ever decided to do something and say, I'm going to do this, and then when the situation arises, did something different? Is that familiar? How many have been in a situation that um, have an argument with someone, or your boss, relationship, friend, and then you really want to do something, but you didn't say anything at all? Is that familiar? And afterwards, you realize you were right. Okay. The whole thing when inspired for me many years ago when I used to work uh, a different job before this job I'm doing now. And I was working for a, a company and my boss was a, a little bit hard. And he was kind of uh, bullying me a lot. Asking me to do this and to do this and to do this and to do this. And I was always following him with a very nice smile on my face. And I, deep in my heart I hated him. Then I thought maybe I should do something about that. What did I do? I went and did a seminar about being assertive. Spend a lot of money, I bought some books, I spent all night rehearsing. He's going to ask me to do this, and I'm going to do that. He asked me to do this, and I'm going to do that. I did all these exercises all night and prepared myself so well. Okay? And then I go to work on Monday, walked in very confident, and I'm just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Minis, nice. do this. Big smile on my face. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Is that familiar? <laughs> Have you ever uh, thought, yes, when I go home, I'm just going to tell her this. Yes, I'm going to tell her that. And I go home, yeah, hi, how are you? <laughs> now, have you noticed like there's the two parts of us, like two people, and we keep doing something, and then I go home and say, why did I do that? I'm never, ever going to do it again. And then I do it again. I do it again. You know, my latest, the last one that really pushed me over the edge was, I bought this book about the power of now, to be here now, and to be present, because I have a tendency to kind of... Uh, sometimes fantasize and daydream, you know. So I was sitting on the ground and I said, now, now I'm going to be very present in the moment. I watch the stations, the door open and close, People, I'm here now, and I miss the station. <laughs> I see, there is, it seems like we live in two different worlds. I decide to do something, but then my actions are very different. What's going on here? Can I have the flip chart, please? Now, um, yes, one of my most inspiring people who put this in perspective to me is someone called Dr. Bruce Lipton. He's a neuroscientist. He said that um, our consciousness, I think this is probably the small one. Okay. Do you have the other one? Other uh, marker? Where is it? Oh, new technology. Okay. Okay. Our consciousness, 95% of our consciousness, almost 99% is unconscious, or subconscious rather, and 1% is conscious. That means I have many dreams, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, and then when the time comes, all my subconscious comes along and act for me. Is that familiar to you? Have you ever w woken up one day and said, okay, I'm actually deci I, I decided to be slim. I am going to go on a diet for two weeks. From tomorrow morning, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to go to work, come early, I'm going to go to the gym and do two aerobic classes. And I'm really, really, this time I'm going to really do it. This is the uh, conscious part that knows your dreams, your vision, your creativity, everything you want. I do this every uh, New Year's Eve, my New Year's, New Year's Eve resolution, you see. And before the summer, because I want to look fit and healthy, you see. So what happens after we make these decisions? Actually, I say, actually, for two weeks, I'm not going to eat anything. Just orange juice. Uh, I can do it. This time, I can do it. Then, of course, I set the alarm to 6 o'clock in the morning. Alarm goes off. And I start my exercises with my eyelids. <laughs> and then I find myself in front of the bridge, of course, eating. What happened? 
I live in two different worlds. Now, 95, 99% of our consciousness is subconscious and one is conscious. Now I'm talking to you now, a lot of information, you listen very carefully. When you go out, something else will happen. Because we are organized by our subconscious. Now, where is this information that the subconscious come from? This is the big question that we need to answer. Now, from the age of zero to six, we are absorbing information all the time from our family, relationship, friends, our world, our culture, everything around us. From zero to six, we do not have the ability to debate whether the information is correct or not. So we're downloading information in our system. And as we grow up, this information organizes us. So we can't help it. We are like programmed. We are downloading a lot of programs. Now I wanted to look even deeper to it and say how actually we programmed in this information. And I found the most beautiful, amazing insights through working with people, through working with myself, and through uh, research in this area. And some of the things I'm going to share with you are quite in incredible in how we actually have a character. We live in a world that's different than who we want to be and who we really are, which is very critical. When I discovered these things about me, that I live in two different worlds, guess what the first thing I decided to do? I decided to teach people how to be themselves, of course. And what I didn't realize is I'm trying to do it for myself, but which is great. Now I realize I'm doing that. So it's been a great journey for me to learn about me and also learn about other people in my, my journey. Now the journey started like this through my research and working with people. Like I'm going to draw a heart here. This heart represents you, for example. And I'll tell you why I draw this heart. Okay. Now, our journey begins before we are born before we born. I draw a heart here for a reason. I learned, of course, through my work that the first thing that formed in our world is our heart first before, before anything else, which is very interesting. It's a, this is a metaphor in itself. Now, the first stages of becoming conscious is after six months before we were born, in, inside our mother, when we just become six months inside. Now, the introduction to our world, guess where? Which is is inside our mother womb. This introduction to our world. Now, if we happen to be born and be inside a mother who having struggles in her life, <coughs> emotional difficulties, pain, depression, then this world is not safe for us we begin to feel unsafe even before we are created. Can you imagine that? If the mother is having a bad relationship with her husband and she's affected by it, this information is already going into us before we are created. In the past, people used to think, actually, we come in this world clean state, there's nothing wrong with us, and we learn behaviors. Actually, we are already predisposed to some behaviors before we actually were born. Now, after we born the first two years, and this is when it gets very, very critical, and I found the incredible, incredible insights that I came across. The first two years of life, the first two years, there are parts of our brain have not been formed entirely, completely. The first two years, there are places in the brain that is responsible for memory, okay? Today, if somebody upset you or hurt you or challenge you, you will get a chance to talk about it. And tomorrow, you're going to put it into the yesterday and say that happened to me before. And you may say, okay, fine, maybe this person is upset, maybe you're angry, maybe there's something wrong with them, and you can try to recover from it. For example, if you're stuck in a traffic jam and you um, had a very bad time, and then you can say to, your, to some friends, you talk about it, you begin to process it and put it in your past. This part of the brain is not formed in the first two years. So when a child has an experience, he has an experience of fear, rejection, not being loved, the child does not understand, does not understand this experience at all. 
So the first reaction the child will have is fear. Fear is a reaction, reaction to the painful experience and the child does not understand it. Now, the part of the brain that puts things in the past is complete and say this happened to me in the past. But the child does not know it's in the past because the brain is not able to process it. So it did not make sense of it. The only chance for us when we're very young at this stage is to actually react by fear because this is the only thing that we know at this stage. As we grow older over the years and over the years, we're beginning to develop a way to hide or block our fear. How do we hide and block our fear? By a protection. We create a protection. So what I found over the years is this. The stronger the painful experience in childhood, the stronger the fear, the stronger the protection. What does the protection look like? If you are under stress, you smile too much. There are people help too much. People compromise too much. I'm smiling to my boss. This is the protection. So I don't get hurt, you see. All these processes are not conscious. They are very, very fast. Now, the experience, the experience that we had that we did not like, we did not understand, is over. It's finished. But the reaction still remains. You see what I mean? Reaction to it remains. So really, we react to something that is not there anymore. This is, that's why it's very difficult to fix it. Now, there was a beautiful story written about... Um, um, and uh, after the First World War, Japanese had a lot of soldiers in many islands. You probably read it in a book. And uh, over the years, uh, when the war was over, the Japanese drew all the soldiers from different islands. Okay? And they forgot one. So there are some soldiers in one island, they still thought the war is going on. And then what happens is this. Um, every time tourists land on the island, Japanese soldiers attack them. And they discovered that these people living in the past thinking the war is still going on. It is like us. When we are triggered, triggered by some events in the past, we react. How many, how many times you heard the, the expression, somebody pushed my button? This is it, you see. Now, people who have trauma in their life when they are older, they have the same experience in this because that part, of brain, part, of, part of their brain shuts down when we are in trauma. If someone is got raped or pushed or in a war or accident, then you heard the term flashback. The flashback is people remember the event as if it's still happening now. Inside of us, there is no sense of time. So when we are older, if we are in a situation that is slightly frightening, that reminds us of early experience, somebody, you feel like somebody is going to reject you or something, you go there very, very protected. Basically, we live in a reaction. We react. How many times certain people make you react in certain ways, or certain situations make you react in certain ways, and then after you go home, you say, why did I do that? So this is no, there's no sense of time, as if it's happened yesterday. The reason it's like this is because this part of the brain did not put it in the past. It's still alive with you until today. And this way, many, many uh, teachings call it different names. Some people call it the limiting character, protective character, uh, strategy for living, strategy for survivals. And many people live in there and they don't even know they're living there. Now, all these things are memory. But they call it an implicit memory. Implicit memory means it's a hidden memory and we don't know it's a memory. And that's what the biggest struggle people have when they try to, to change themselves. And over the years, when this strategy repeated so much, we begin to identify ourselves with that. We think this is who we are, but this is not who you are. Who you are is this. Everybody here can do so many things in their lives, but we identify with this one. How many times when you speak to people, you? You, uh, you say to, you, to your friends, you know, I'm always the kind of person who's shy and I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. This is the protection you have. Okay. We are not consciously aware of this protection we walk in the world with. I want to offer you a different perspective about this for a moment, how, how this is actually operating. If we can just put the slides for a moment. Okay. We can, you can leave it there for a moment. Okay. 
Let me show you a model that's very interesting. Okay. Um, early experience, which I refer to in, in my model here. Imagine, say, a family together, a couple, have a child, and the child had a bad experience in childhood, or one of the parents left, or parents had an argument. The child begins to carry this unconscious belief that there's something wrong with them. Maybe they're not good, maybe, some, maybe people don't like them, maybe something happening around them. Now, here is the most fascinating that happen, the things that happen to us. If I carry a belief, guess what I do in my life? I go out there, and I find a way to confirm my beliefs. Let me give you an example. How many of you tried to buy a car of a certain shape or size or color, and you kept seeing it everywhere? Anybody did that? Because we actually focus on what we want to see. So we, uh, I have noticed uh, when, when people are, um, have a vulnerability in an issue, it keeps materialized everywhere around them. Uh, people who are afraid of rejection end up in rejection situations. And people attract to them what they are afraid of, you see. Now, next one is very interesting even. Um, when, when you have these triggering events around you, you find them everywhere. This is what they call in psychology an attention bias, because your attention on something you find in everywhere. Next one is automatic negative thoughts. See if this relates to you. Have you ever said to yourself one day, this always happened to me? Is that familiar? You know, have you ever been in a supermarket, and you go in a supermarket, and you stand in the long queue, and you look at the other queue, it's going faster. And you say, oh my god, I always stand in the long queue, and you run to the other queue, and this one starts going faster. <laughs> And you go back there here, and this one starts going faster. And you say, man, it's always happened to me, you see. And then you say, good, I'm going to stay here. And when you reach to the tail, it stops working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and when I arrive abroad to any country and stand in immigration, everybody's going faster but mine. <laughs> and if I go there, something goes wrong here. Okay? Now, okay, it's always happening to me. How many times in relationship, oh, they always leave me, of course. They always go away. I always love them first, and they, when I love them, they go away from me. Now, <laughs> uh, you, wait, you don't use buses here very much, because I think everybody with cars, but in England, when I go and wait in the bus stop, all the buses come except mine. <laughs> yeah. A second day, I'm going somewhere else, different bus, all the other ones come except this one. And it's, it's always happening to me. Now, this is our automatic negative thoughts we keep saying to ourselves. Is that familiar? Yeah? Now, then what happened next is, when you have these automatic negative thoughts, it affects your energy, your body, your feelings, and even actions. How many of you have gone to a party, and you said to yourself, I don't know anybody here. Uh, uh, well, um, um, maybe I'm a little shy. And you stand in a certain way, you know, and uh, you look like this, and, and nobody talks to you. And then you walk out of the party and say, of course, I'm shy, nobody talks to me. Yeah? And then, you produce the results that confirms your belief about yourself. And this is a, a vicious cycle. You are caught in it. You, and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger all the time. Now, um, this, uh, you know, let me tell you something about the uh, uh, power of talking to yourself. You want to practice something? Look at your fingers and say, Fingers come together. Keep repeating. Fingers come together. 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 Keep saying it. Fingers come together. What happens? Look at the power of your automatic negative thoughts. Your body follows you everywhere. It's quite amazing if you can see that. Now, that's that when you produce these results here, you confirm your beliefs about yourself. Can you see? So what do we do about all this? What is the answer? Now I gave you the problem. What is the answer? Be in the present. Okay. Now, um, we have a lot of research and we know about our problems. Very few people give us the answer. Very few people. Now, I selected the previous video for very good reason. Now. Would you be able, in life, to observe your automatic negative thoughts? Would you be able to be okay with you when you make mistakes? 
something fascinating I found about human beings, and me in particular, of course. When I make a mistake, I say, it is wrong, it is bad, you shouldn't have done that. But we all do that. When is the moment we can come and stop and say, okay, I am doing this. I'm vulnerable, like the other lady said. I'm vulnerable. This is what I'm doing. How much compassion we have for ourselves when we make mistakes. This is one of the keys of success. Can we observe ourselves when we are saying these kind of things? If anybody asks you to change, it will be impossible to change. Because the, what we repeated over the years for many, many years, repeated, 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 has become brain connections. It's very difficult to change. Uh, you know about the Pavlov studies of the dogs and, yes? Okay. This is, uh, Pavlov was the master of introducing the idea for us, but when we repeat something long enough, it is very difficult to change it. But we need to re-educate ourselves and observe ourselves all the time when we are saying things like this to ourselves with enough loving to ourselves that we can be okay even when we're vulnerable, when having problems and struggle. When I work with people, I, of course, now, now I'm talk I am talking only, I'm talking in words. And it's very difficult through the words to get into the feelings that we carried for many years. So when we work with people in seminars and courses, we get into this work and find that what we say to ourselves and how can we correct that. Uh, one of the things that I always um, say to people when I end courses or when they ask me about loving ourselves, what does it mean? What does it mean to love ourselves? What does it mean? I, I, I've been reading many books, everybody saying, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. And I think it's putting us under a huge amount of pressure to love ourselves. We don't know how. Do you know how? Do you know how? I think it's impossible to love ourselves. How can I do that? How can I read the books and love myself? What am I gonna, do I look in the mirror and say, Manisa, I love you? <laughs> uh, uh, then I realized one day, actually, the only way to love me is to observe myself when I don't like myself. To observe myself when I'm judging myself. To observe myself when I say, you're not good enough then this is the process of beginning to be okay with myself. Would it be, would be a great challenge for all of us to live with ourselves, to live with me when I'm making mistakes, to live with me when I do something wrong, to live with me when I'm not good? And this is the way to begin to conquer all these limitations within ourselves. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier about the, the heart and the, yeah. I want, to, I want to finish with the way we learn to protect ourselves in the world is very similar to the way our parents learn to protect themselves because we are very very similar to our parents we have already inherited not inherited learned from things how the world look like they introduce us to the world if you um, won't upset anybody you tell them just like your father you just like your mother. <laughs> and they fight to death for that. It is true, consciously, they are not like their parents, but subconsciously they are. And the difference between the two things, we live in a struggle because uh, the conscious part of it has many goals, dreams, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do that. But because the majority of the programs we carry inside us work in the other direction, so we only have one way to go, is to be conscious of what we do conscious and have so much love and compassion for ourselves every time we repeat that until the time comes when we'll be able to be at peace with who we are if anybody here hoping that you'll change you will not change you but the, the change happen when you be able to live with you as you are and i think this is probably the end of what i'm going to say thank you for listening thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, the time for the question and answer has arrived.